introduce yourself. All right, hi, my name is Jonathan Hernandez. I'm a PhD candidate in the English department here at the University of Florida. I'm also a graduate instructor. Uh, I've taught different classes in my time here. Uh, Serving American literature, right now I'm teaching first year composition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanted to ask you five questions that I came up with um, after I did my research. And the first one is, do you think that you, what you learn at this university makes you feel more or less connected to the other communities that you belong to outside of the university? And that is uh, familial, cultural, class, or interest-based communities. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. And I actually might want to reframe it a little bit because my research is actually, I think, an attempt to connect to these other communities. Mm -hmm. So my dissertation project is looking at uh, autobiographical or semi-autobiographical texts by Latinx authors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, it's a way to feel more connected. Mm -hmm. Uh, because everyone has their own research interests at the university and mm -hmm. even in the classes that you teach you don't always get a chance to like, explore those things mm -hmm. so I've kind of taken that as an opportunity to to explore uh, those things that really speak to me in terms of mm -hmm. family community and, and the things that I'm reading and, and researching. So you think then because of the research that you chose you found a way to feel connected to the community outside to your community outside? Yes for sure. Okay. So in that way, what you learn at the university makes you feel connected because you chose it. Um, before you did that, how would you answer that question? Before you chose that particular research? Mm -hmm. That's another very good question. So when I started here, uh, I've always been interested, or my main focus is in contemporary American literature. So mm -hmm. when I came here, I was really interested in, in African American literature, and that was actually uh, the basis of my master's thesis. Then after a while, I realized that my real interest, not my real interest, but mm -hmm. um, a Did big you part feel of my closer? interest. Yes, thank you. That's a, that's a good way of rephrasing it. I felt closer mm -hmm. to just experiences. Um, of Latinx authors mm -hmm. right, and characters that they would write about, mm -hmm. and so I decided to focus on that instead. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. okay, nice. Um, okay, so my second question. What role does your Hispanic identity play in the classroom, um, both as an instructor and as a student of English? What are some of the dynamics that you notice take place when you're a student in the English classroom and when you're a teacher as well, an instructor? And how do you feel about these dynamics? Do you do anything to kind of guide the kind of dynamic that you want to have, that you feel um, creates a comfortable classroom environment for you and your students in the case of when you're teaching? Right. I think the, the short answer to the question is that it depends on the class, mm -hmm. really. So I've had the opportunity to teach a couple of classes uh, on Latinx literature and, and culture, and mm -hmm. so there, the students automatically see me as an authority because mm -hmm. they just see my last name, right, Hernandez, mm -hmm. so they assume I'm some sort of authority, right. either through my lived experiences or just like, oh, you know, that he has like a, he has like a Hispanic You have the legitimacy and validation right away. Right, and so that one, that's a little bit different. Usually, mm -hmm. I don't really bring much of my personal identity into the classroom mm -hmm. otherwise, mm -hmm. um, although I do, I don't do it as much anymore, but when I first started, um, something that I would do that's maybe a little odd, but mm -hmm. it helped me connect with my students, mm -hmm. is that I would actually tell them my background, right? Mm -hmm. um, because for me, I was growing up, they was instilled in me that education was really important. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom was always very supportive. She would always say, you know, regardless of what you want to do, just mm -hmm. study and go to school. Mm -hmm. And so I would tell part of my story to students just to get them to understand that we're all coming from different places and mm -hmm. I think my intent with that or, or my hope was that if there was a student in their room who had a similar upbringing mm -hmm. that they would feel that connection mm -hmm. uh, and they would say oh you know this sounds like my story which goes back to the my answer to the first question right mm -hmm. that when I was reading certain authors certain things uh, and their experiences would resonate with me I would feel more connected right it's mm -hmm. like oh I'm not the only one who's gone through this or who's mm -hmm. thinking these things there's other mm -hmm. people who have come before me mm -hmm. and so I think in the classroom that was my way of doing that mm -hmm. um, but yeah 
for that one. Let's see if there's something else that I didn't touch on here. Um, when you have taught, and I asked you this before, just um, between me and you, um, when you have taught classes that are not Latinx, um, have you felt a different dynamic with your students? You said when you've taught those courses, right away, right, they see your last name and you're yeah. teaching that course and it makes sense. Um, when you've taught American Lit? I taught American Lit and American just writing lit. classes. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed a different dynamic with your students or maybe that it's in your own mind or what dynamic do you notice? Yeah, I think there it's more kind of a, a gen, I don't know if that's the right term, but more of a generic experience. Although I do think sometimes that students will sign up for the classes because they see the name of the instructor. Uh -huh. And maybe that conveys them to them. Like, I've never asked. I think it's like a strange thing to ask students. Uh -huh. But I, I do sometimes feel like, hmm, did they sign up for this class because they saw my name, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that just made them more comfortable. Like, maybe. oh, like, this is somebody who, who, I don't know, might not be as... Maybe like a, so a you think that other Hispanic students, when they see your last name in, a, say, an American lit class, yeah. chose the class because of that, yeah. to feel more comfortable? Maybe. I mean, it's all conjecture. It I have done you. that as a student, so I don't... I wouldn't um, put it past it that that could have happened. Yeah, yeah. That, that that is something that might happen. It's a good point. Like, like I said, like I wouldn't... I think it would be strange to ask them. It would be kind of intrusive. Mm -hmm. But I have wondered that... Uh, and, and again, it's just conjecture, and I've been like, oh, this was the only class that fit my schedule, and that's why I'm taking this class. Right. But usually in those classes, um, hey, actually, let me, like, let, me, let me amend my answer, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I will bring in um, aspects of my identity through the readings, mm -hmm. right? So when I, last time I taught the Survey of American Land, we read some Gloria Anzaldúa, mm -hmm. um, I contest that, that with Richard Rodriguez, right, mm -hmm. and just kind of ha have the students discuss. Obviously, I have my perspectives on the readings, but like, I'm trying to remain impartial, right? right. Um, so just like, what do you all think about this? And just kind of right. have them discuss. Mm -hmm. So that might be a way through through the readings, through the course material. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that you have felt like connections with other Hispanic students in the class. Um, what do you think has been the dynamic with students that are not Hispanic in your class? How do you think your identity as a Hispanic man, and of course they can see that in your last name right away, yeah. how do you think that plays out in the classroom when you're teaching? It's hard to tell, because usually I'm so focused on what I'm doing mm -hmm. in a given moment, like when you're in front of the classroom, you're just trying to uh, lead a discussion for that day, or if you're lecturing, right, so I don't have time or like I can't focus on on those aspects of it. I think it's through the reading, right? I think and you bring up an important point that the things that we do hopefully reach uh, every student, right? Mm -hmm. Regardless of whether they share our background, right? Mm -hmm. So the same thing, this, like as I was mentioning earlier, right? So some the, through the readings, trying to um, diversify the types of things that we're reading about, talking about. Um, sometimes I will explain my decision process, especially for mm -hmm. something like American Life. So like, in the beginning, we were looking at very canonical texts, but as we progress in the course, I'm introducing you know, to different authors, mm -hmm. uh, because I am mindful of that, right? trying to mm -hmm. give students a, a, a wider range of representation, even if I don't Mm -hmm. call attention to it in the classroom, that hopefully they'll, they'll be able to see that through the things that we're mm -hmm. reading and talking about. But how do you feel about the fact that most syllabi starts with the canonical text, right? Um, and that's why male writers at first. Yeah. So the order of the syllabi is very much telling yeah. of what is centered and what is the hierarchy in the classroom. Have you ever thought about switching that order? No, and if I had the chance to see survey again, I, I think I would do. Try, I, I would try to do something to to change that because I have thought about that. It's like <laughs> the survey is supposed to be a historical overview, right? And so, mm -hmm. unfortunately, for a big part of history, like that was that was the status quo, right? The canon. Mm -hmm. um, but it might be interesting to try to disrupt that in a way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe be more intentional about what I'm doing, like telling the students, like, yes, I know this is uh, mm -hmm. this looks a certain way. Hmm. Just looking at different, I don't know if right. I'm making And sense that's here. interesting that you're saying that because one of the scholars that I'm researching, his idea is um, in order to be able to restructure that syllabi, is to think instead of the history of the 
European American literary canon, if you expand the definition of what constitutes as literature, mm. right, um, past print, then you're able to start the syllabi with the people, for instance, if we're teaching in U.S. soil, mm -hmm. the native people and the literatures that they were doing first before then the English came to the U.S. And in that way, you're able to restructure um, the syllabus. So that's one idea. Yeah. And you're able to give kind of like a global, a more global perspective of literature and expand that definition. And you're able to then restructure that syllabus to center, um, to recenter, right? Um, so you don't have to necessarily start in the way that we start now. But that's one idea. I don't know. Yeah. I have, and we've kind of gone... <laughs> oh, rogue here, oh, yeah. but I kind of like it. Um, do you think that that would? Do you think that that would benefit your students, or do you think that somehow they would not be getting tools that they need in order to then face standardized testing, you know, employment, yeah. kind of? Thing? Do you think that that would be doing them a disservice and therefore not empowering them actually? Because we don't want to do that, right? Right. I do like your idea of maybe rethinking how to begin the course. I think this is maybe more specific, but the, the class itself, right, and this is the one I, that, that I teach, or one of the ones that I teach, but I don't know if you know, for example, the survey of British literature has two, two different classes, right? So it's like early, early British and then more contemporary stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, here at UF, the survey of American literature doesn't have that component, it's just the one class, right? So it's very hard already to have this kind of wide range from the beginning. It might be helpful to find a way to split it into like early American and more contemporary and that would I see. give um, instructors more room to right. do these things. There's only so much you can do like in 15 weeks, right? Or 16 weeks. Right. Um, but answering your question, I do think about this a lot and it's something that I, I kind of turn around my head as an instructor. Mm -hmm. The things that I want to do to empower students and to encourage them um, but also kind of keeping in mind that not every instructor is going to engage with them in the same way mm -hmm. or consider them in the same way. Mm -hmm. So I might say, let's do this here and here's the reasons, but another instructor might not be as flexible with the curriculum or just think the way that they engage with students, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm mindful of that, even though it's something that I can't really control, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, at least for me, mm -hmm that that shouldn't be something that holds you back, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's something that you, again, that's a situation you can't control, right? Mm -hmm. So why not be encouraging and supportive in my classroom, mm -hmm. right? Why not introduce them to people that they might otherwise not know about or read about, mm -hmm. right? Right, because there is that anxiety that am I not preparing them for the next instructor or for the next test or the next, you know, employer that is going to expect something else that is maybe not trying to reach out in these ways. That's always the anxiety that we feel. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, so my third question is, do you ever think about the different languages that populate your classroom? That is, the languages that you and your students speak outside the classroom, such as um, different ways of speaking English, local ways of speaking English, for instances, um, and that are sometimes classed and racialized. Um, other languages other than English, for instance, um, and so basically other languages as opposed to standard academic English, which is the one that, right, on, without saying it, is what we value in the English composition classroom. Right. Do you ever consider those languages? How do you navigate the fact that students are coming in with different home languages? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, really goes back to the earlier question, right? Uh, I might not think about specific languages or home languages in particular, but I do think about this idea of academic English, right? Mm -hmm. And this is part of what we were just talking about, that even if I don't feel like students should write in a particular way, that's not going to be the same for other instructors mm -hmm. or other classes, right? Mm -hmm. So even small things, uh, I'm going through this right now with uh, ENC 1101s, so it's one of the first year comp classes, Right, and so one of the one of the tenets of academic English is you uh, don't use contractions, mm -hmm. uh, don't use a second person, mm -hmm. right? And so 
sometimes we tell these things to students, but I personally don't right. uh, don't put as much emphasis on it or, mm -hmm. or weigh them as much. To me, it doesn't really make a difference because ultimately, it's, if you can understand what the person is saying, mm -hmm. then it's all good. I, right. uh, this is a slightly different mm -hmm. um, topic, but we in, the, in these classes, we have a lot of international students or students who, who speak other languages in English. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I always think of that when I'm looking at their writing, right? Mm -hmm. Focus more on the content of what they're communicating or attempting to communicate mm -hmm. rather than the way in which they're writing. Mm -hmm. But yes, unfortunately, not every instructor is going to have hold those beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that you have to speak in a certain way, mm -hmm. and it's not just in the in the realm of education or academia, mm -hmm. uh, it's like the working world, right? The, just society in general, mm -hmm. right? That there's a certain way of speaking, of communicating, right. and that you have to stick to it. And if you don't know it, you have to kind of learn the rules. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've gone through this. We've all gone through this, right? Even mm -hmm. entering into academia or, or as students, that no, maybe this isn't the way that I communicate at home or I feel comfortable mm -hmm. communicating. But you kind of have to learn that style, right? Mm -hmm. um, in order to to become part of, of, of these other communities. Right, to be taken seriously. Yes. And you definitely see that with students trying to throw in what they think are like the academic words, even if they're not comfortable with it. And that's them trying to perform yeah. that persona in the class. Um, and so I think you made a good point about you try to read the specific student. And so it's important that you know, like the improvement that wants that this student is making um, instead of just looking for like keywords in a, a particular style. So maybe looking at the progress that one student is making from when they came in, you talked about international students. Mm -hmm. So you're taking into account that student and the progress that they are doing and how they're moving in the class rather than holding their writing to one standard, all the students to one standard. But you're right, not every professor is going to do that perhaps or maybe have the time to look at the particular students and the, their particular progress. So these are things to think about. Um, my fourth question is, do you think that keeping these linguistic worlds separate, so we have like the home languages um, versus like academic language in the classroom. So do you think that keeping these linguistic worlds separate or to value one above the other in the classroom is important for achieving the learning goals of the university. And again, that's that question of like performing achievement. Are we doing them a disservice? Are we not empowering them when we do open up in these ways? Are we not preparing them for the next professor or the next test or the next employer? Or do you think that um, each class can come up with their own um, kind of evaluation, way of evaluating. And I spoke to you about this earlier. One scholar has this idea about grading contracts. So the class comes up with a contract together about what they're going to evaluate in the class, how they're going to evaluate. Um, so that teacher and student decides what is valued in the classroom according to the people who make up that classroom. So do you think that it is important to keep these distinctions in order for them to be prepared or do you think that we can create these kinds of considerations of who the people that are in the classroom actually are and the knowledges that they bring in from home, particularly linguistic knowledges, uh, for my interest? Or do you think that would be disadvantaging them? Yeah. And I think we've, we've pretty much been talking about this. So it's kind of the same question. Really, I keep saying this, but I mean it. Like these are all really excellent questions. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. So I think let me try to kind of find a way to address all these all these things that that you're asking here. I think as an instructor, for me, I try to be encouraging and supporting in clear, obvious ways, and maybe ways that aren't as obvious or as clear. But I think what makes my teaching or my approach to teaching more complicated is ultimately working in the university, right? Uh, and keeping in mind the things that I have to do as an employee of the university. Mm -hmm. So for example, in these writing classes that we have, we have some degree of autonomy, but we uh, 
don't have complete choice when it comes to designing assignments, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're teaching 1101 or 1102, it's like, here's, here are the assignments that you need to teach, mm -hmm. here's the word count, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have any power over that. And I think this is like a, a big issue here, right? This, this notion of power. So even if I wanted to say, uh, I'm going to reach out to my students and we can design a, a grading contract together, mm -hmm. it wouldn't necessarily work mm -hmm. because it would clash with this idea of what this class is supposed to be or what this mm -hmm. course is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to the first part of the question, right, this idea of the learning goals of the university, mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of thoughts about the university <laughs> and about academia, but just to kind of keep it short here, mm -hmm. uh, what the university wants, right, is to create a sense of community. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we are cognizant of the ways in which it fails or kind of breaks down mm -hmm. when you think about people from various backgrounds, but that's the intent, right? Mm -hmm. That in the university you can have people from different backgrounds, right, different uh, life experiences come together and commingle in this space, mm -hmm. right? And so the university is very invested in this idea of like the community, right? I mean, here at UF we have this notion of the Gator Nation, right? Mm -hmm. That it's kind of a, a strange patriotic, kind of like, <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of iffy to me. But ultimately this really complicates things, right? Mm -hmm because the university wants to develop a curriculum because they want consistency. Mm -hmm. And so I'm also thinking about where I'm at at this stage of my professional career, right? Uh, I'm still a graduate instructor, so going back to this idea of power, I don't have the, the power or the authority to enact all the ideas that I would like, right? So there's policies that I have to follow. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I was referring to earlier. So that definitely complicates things. Um, I would want to, now I'm kind of thinking, I would want to find ways to kind of operate within mm -hmm. within those parameters and mm -hmm. still do the things that I want to do for my students, right? But ultimately that really does complicate things, mm -hmm. right? That uh, even in our syllabi, right? We have to include you know, standard university boilerplate in terms of like attendance policies mm -hmm. or, or that type of information, right? Mm -hmm. right? And I mean, you always have like these goals what you're supposed to learn from the class. Perhaps there's room to go through those with the students yeah. and kind of expand and talk about what they mean exactly and in that way bring in maybe things that that they know into the class that can be valued in the class. Perhaps, can you think of any anything that is usually in, in one of these introductory classes as like a learning goal? Not anything on top of my head, but uh, this actually, I just talked about this earlier this week. So something that students often have difficulties with is the word count for the assignments, mm -hmm. right? So not to get too long into this, but Florida has this uh, Gordon rule, right, for public universities where mm -hmm. students have to write, I believe it's, it's 24,000 words total, mm -hmm. right? And so they have to take several classes. Each class, you write at least 6,000 words. So a lot of the classes that I'm teaching now um, are those types of composition courses. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and students become really fixated on the word count for assignments, right? Mm -hmm. And so I always have to remind them it's a range. And I also give them like a, a, a talk where I tell them, because they know this already, right? Even even if they're, they're not conscious of it, that there's the things that we do in the classroom and then the way that things work in the real world. I always right. use air quotes because this right. is this is all real, obviously. But they see a difference between what yeah. happens in the classroom and what happens outside. And the fact that they see that difference has a lot to do with how we structure the classroom, I feel. Yeah. Should it feel that different, I guess is my question. Would it be beneficial to the students, to learning, to for the classroom not to feel like it's so separate from the world? And how can we make it feel less separate? That is a question. Perhaps we don't feel like it would benefit yeah. um, academia to do that. But that, I, I suppose, is one of my questions. It's tough. And so you try to navigate with the word count. Yeah, it's tough because even, even in other classes, um, I try to do things that might potentially disrupt this teacher-student relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but I think students don't necessarily want that because um, this is maybe a little harsh, they've been conditioned to, or they're, they've grown up to expect, you know, the person who's in the classroom is the authority, mm -hmm. they know what they're doing, I'm here as a student to kind of just receive this information, right? right? So even things like participating, um, when we want them to kind of push back on ideas or maybe um, come up with their, their own insights, just because of their experiences as students, like they, they, 
they know that it's not really how things are supposed to work, mm -hmm. right? That they're students, they're here to learn. Mm -hmm. um, we're the ones doing the work, we're the ones in the front mm -hmm. of the room. So um, I had an interesting experience this, mm -hmm. this semester with 1101, where one of my co-teachers actually was leading an activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and the students were having a very spirited discussion. But then mm -hmm. one of the students said, uh, oh, like, we're, we're, we're just, we're, how do you say it? We're teaching ourselves, or you're letting, mm -hmm. up, you're letting us run the class. Mm -hmm. But the way he said it, it didn't sound like a compliment right. and like as teachers like oh you've you've lost control right. of this classroom that wasn't right. really the case mm -hmm. because students are still kind of very they're comfortable with the traditional yes, model and they feel like they can learn only when they're being taught in that way yes um so top down then you're gaining the tool that you're going to need for to get gain employment to get ahead so that's their concern. Am I getting the tools that I need in order to get a job? Yeah. And that's very valid. So I suppose we would have to find ways of investigating that this is actually useful for them. To rearrange these hierarchies is actually useful for them and useful for them in the world. It's actually going to make help them learn more and be right um, more successful in that way, which they are concerned about. They're paying, yeah. right? They're paying to be here to get these tools paying. and be, right? Somebody's paying. You're right, somebody's saying. Um, so that's a valid concern that they have. Yeah. And I think if we want to make academia more accessible to more people, we need to also make sure that it is empowering in these ways that they want to be empowered as well, right? Yeah. Um, for the, that real world. So I'm really glad that we've come to that in the conversation because whenever I've brought up my research, that is something that is always the but. Right, but is this going to be detrimental to students as far as making a living? Really, comes down to that, right? Because we're here to learn, but also we need to sustain ourselves. And there are standards that are set up, and there are, you know, hoops that we have to go through in order to get to gain employment. And, and we need to make sure that they have those tools, or we're giving them those tools right. at the same time. So how do we do both? expand and make more accessible, but also make sure that they're getting the necessary tools for a world that is not necessarily all of it doing that, making things accessible. Um, and this is my last question. So, and maybe we've already covered it, but I'll read it anyways. Do you think that academia can stand to gain from transformations like these in which the hierarchy of linguistic evaluation is reorganized to make up a constellation to use a cultural rhetoric's term, of languages and thereby knowledges that are valued in the English composition classroom? Or do you think that this would result in students not being prepared to face testing and employment uh, employment um, with the necessary tools, thereby actually disempowering them? Again, that's where we've landed anyways in our conversation before going into the questions. And any final thoughts about that? I think for sure academia could stand to, to gain from being more inclusive and not just kind of in that lip service way that mm -hmm. all these institutions are like, we value diversity, mm -hmm. right? Um, but actually meaning that. And I think it, it's very, very difficult, not just at the university level, because these are systemic issues, right? Uh, in the workplace, just in everyday life, uh, are people's different knowledges, different uh, languages mm -hmm. value? Mm -hmm. Not really, right? There's that hierarchy of like, who knows best, who knows what's right. Working uh, class, professional class, yes. for instance. Like even in the professions, right? So it's already, this is like too dramatic maybe, uh, the well's already tainted by the time that our students come to us, right? Mm -hmm. Because they've grown up learning, okay. These certain, hierarchies, they come in with these hierarchies. Like that certain job or certain types of professions are more important or more valuable mm -hmm. than others, right? Mm -hmm. We see this all the time in the classroom, mm -hmm. right? They might not express it in these ways, but I always get the sense that they, that, not all of them, obviously, but that a lot of students don't necessarily value the humanities and what mm -hmm. we do, right? Because that's not as important. It's like, oh, what do you do? You spend all your time talking about literature and just writing, um, right? Yeah, and so and there's talking a, about being human. And so there's a, there's an inherent sense of that what we're doing is not as important or as valuable. And so it would be a really difficult challenge to overcome that, right? And I don't think it's obviously all up to us, but I think we do need to be mindful that that is students' attitudes oftentimes, 
mm -hmm. right? Where they don't see things like writing having a central role in their lives. Mm -hmm. Just yesterday, right, I asked, them, uh, asked our students what they think of writing or how they feel about writing. Mm -hmm. And so I was expecting these responses. So you get stuff like, oh, writing is stupid or it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always like to... Um, I'm surprised that we're that honest. But that's good, right? Yeah. Like, maybe it's not what I want to hear, but it's good that but I feel comfortable, comfortable expressing that thought. Right. And so what I was going to say is that, for me, then the work is, okay, what are we really saying here, right? Um, and so without singling mm -hmm. students out and making them feel uncomfortable, just saying, okay, if somebody says that writing is stupid, it's a waste of time, mm -hmm. why is that? Because they have, maybe it's because they haven't seen mm -hmm. other people maybe consider it as important, mm -hmm. or maybe it's, it's hard, right? Like the example that I gave to try to, mm -hmm. to encourage them to come with their own is like, for me, writing is hard, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even though I've done this for a while and I have more practice than a lot of them, writing is so hard. It's, it's hard, period, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so just kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, just having these spaces where students are encouraged to be honest, mm -hmm. right, and that they feel supported, even if it's not the, I tell them all the time, you know, tell me what you think. Don't tell mm -hmm. me what you think I want to hear. Because I think sometimes students are... Are. That's right, and that's one way in which you're kind of blurring that border between the classroom and the real world, between their classroom persona and who they are, right? That's great. That's, tell me what you're thinking, not what you are what you think I want to hear. Yeah. Cause I remember like the type of student that I was, right, and I always wanted to... I. I thought of myself back then as like the good student. Mm -hmm. And now I recognize as an instructor mm -hmm. that oftentimes when we think of the good students, mm -hmm. usually the one who does, the person who does what they're expected to do, but then they don't really question anything, right? It's just like, you're very serious. You don't really, yes. you don't really question anything. Yes. And that's good, right? Because we, 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 as much as we sometimes say that we want to change things, sometimes we still want that structure, that stability, right? And that's obviously a problem. Complacency. Yeah. And I was the same student. I was the A student. I think a lot of us in academia were that kind of student that we were A students because we didn't question, right? We followed and felt comfortable with the rules of academia in the classroom. But not every student is that student. So how do we make it more accessible to students that maybe, right, they're just as smart, but they don't feel comfortable with the academic standards, the language, mm -hmm. the way that academia is, and it's very particular. So how do we make it where different people um, feel comfortable in it to participate in it and of course I'm particularly interested in language and the way we speak mm -hmm. um, because I'm interested in immigrant communities and students maybe who are the children of, of immigrants and so from home they're speaking different languages and they come in and they have to perform not only a different language but also as far as English but then also academic language so it's, it's both of those um, but it also expands to, you know, children of, you know, working class parents yes. who are first generation um, college students, right? And the way that they speak at home is different from the academic language. And they also feel like outsiders. And that's one of the, the ways in which they don't feel as comfortable in the classroom, for instance, right? So there's many different ways, many different voices yes. that kind of are left out feeling like peripheral. Um, when we have that unspoken value system in the English composition classroom, that standard academic English is the one and only, right? And the number one value and everything else is underneath. So you kind of try to like stifle that and, and, and either say, okay, this is hard and stupid, or you try to perform it, which is what we did. Yeah. <laughs> so how do we rearrange that to feel like these are different languages, a constellation of different languages and different knowledges, and they're all valuable and, you know, and therefore perhaps make it so that more people feel like they can participate, but without, without um, keeping in mind, right? Still keeping in mind that they have to, perhaps for other classes, for other standard tests, write in a certain way, speak in a, in a certain way for employment, keeping those things in mind. And I guess that's been our conversation. I think that's, that's a good way to conclude it, unless you have anything else to say. No, I was going to say, uh, speaking to the point, I think I mentioned this at the beginning uh, of, uh, what do you call this, an interview, I guess? 
I think that's what it is. A conversation. A conversation. Thank you. I like that. We have like interview sounds too stuffy. Yes, um, these are convers. This is like conversation cards I used to have um, in the south. I learned yeah. On, in, yeah in the middle of a table conversation cards and everybody will take them and, and have the conversation in that way so these are the conversation cards okay. so going back to earlier in our conversation so one thing I do this again this goes back to providing a space where students feel comfortable I actually mm-hmm. use myself as an example oftentimes mm-hmm. I'll tell them hey um, here's one quick example when I was an undergrad one of my first English classes, I wrote a paper mm-hmm. and I got marked down a lot because I didn't know MLA, but there was never mm-hmm. an explanation. Or, to my recollection, we never went over MLA in class. Mm-hmm. It was just like you were already expected to know it. Mm-hmm. If you didn't, then you would go and try to figure it out yourself, mm-hmm. right? And obviously, that's not what I do in my class. I, uh, even if they're not paying attention all the uh, all the mm-hmm. time, I go over a citation and stuff like that because I remember. Mm-hmm. Um, just how I felt after that experience, right? right? Um, I because think... that's an element of specific to academia, right? The MLA guy, for instance. Yes, or this idea that many people have written about this and talked about this, right? And that there's a lot of unspoken rules in mm-hmm. college and academia, right? Of things to do, things not to do. Mm-hmm. But if you don't come from that background or mm-hmm. if you don't have somebody you feel comfortable asking, then mm-hmm. you're gonna miss all those things, right? right? So you were speaking to this earlier, I'm also a first generation student. Mm-hmm. My mom only went to school till the third grade, I think. My mm-hmm. dad went to school till the sixth grade. Mm-hmm. So growing up, that was definitely something that, that I was lacking, right? Mm-hmm. Or even in high school, mm-hmm. when it came time to apply to college, uh, a lot of my friends, they would ask their parents or they had the right. the experiences of their older siblings to go off of and mm-hmm. a lot of these things I had to figure out for myself mm-hmm. and so I always keep that in mind not uh, in a necessarily in a resentful way but just mm-hmm. that I would have wanted somebody to help me and so mm-hmm. that's what I try to do as an instructor right mm-hmm. here's Fill that gap between the yes. students that have academic knowledge and language in their homes and the ones that don't and since in the classroom that is the one that is valued then there's going to be a discrepancy, right? Inequality as far. And of course you don't want to feel intimidated or stupid by asking things that it's expected that you already know. And so you won't ask and then that's an right. issue. Right. And so for me, I always use myself as an example. And so it's, it's funny, okay. like I tell them it's okay. Mm-hmm. Like no one really laughs, but okay. it's like, like I went through that, right? And so it, that hopefully it shows them that it's okay. Like no, we're, we don't all know everything all the time. Mm-hmm. One example, like the library. So right? we just had a library talk last week. And I told them my first time using the library here, I didn't know how to use those like electronic mm-hmm. stacks. Mm-hmm. And I, what I probably should have done is ask somebody for help. Mm-hmm. But instead I just went on YouTube and I actually <laughs> found the video to have because out of right now. Yes. <laughs> And so I told them, like, they laugh, right? But it's like, maybe some of them are thinking that. And actually did have one person say, like, oh, yeah, now I know what you're talking about Mm -hmm. uh, on how tricky it is to, like, use them. Mm -hmm. Um, But those are examples, right? So I I feel very comfortable kind of bringing myself in in that way Mm -hmm. and saying, like, here's something that happened to me because maybe that has happened to somebody else in that classroom Mm -hmm. or they're thinking the same thing. Um, It's like, no, it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. We're all here to learn. And they'll feel comfortable saying, okay, I do have that question, yeah. <laughs> actually. It's interesting because my parents um, were professionals back in our country, um, in Cuba. So I also didn't have at home um, kind of that academic, U.S. Acad- academic mm-hmm. knowledge. I had Cuba academic knowledge, but I didn't have U.S. academic knowledge. And so I had to, through school, I had to learn these things on my own and be embarrassed sometimes because mm-hmm. I didn't know the kind of um, specificities of U.S. academic language and procedures and um, etiquette, unspoken etiquette, all of that. So I guess that's that's why I've taken an interest in um, in in making it more accessible to people that want to participate and maybe don't feel like they they're fluent mm-hmm. in academic language. Um, but somehow feel like they have the courage to, to participate. So thank you so much for yeah. talking with me and like and connecting in that way. Yeah. I think this is the first time that I had a conversation with another Hispanic instructor in the department and I was able to to connect in this way, like things that, that we have thought about, um, that both of us have, have talked about and, and seeing the ways that you have, that you go about it, gives me some ideas as to like how to develop my my toolbox in, mm-hmm. in the classroom so thanks yeah. again yeah thank you for inviting me and maybe that's where we start right just 
starting to have these conversations and sharing ideas of how to go how, how to go about doing this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's it.